This podcast is sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. By Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Experience the difference an independent pharmacy can make for you and your loved ones. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy offers personalized care, short wait time, very competitive pricing, easy transfer of your prescription, and much more. And by Molly Maid. During these times of COVID-19, it has never been more important to keep your family safe. With the healthy home cleaning system, Molly Maid London is here to help. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Today, we had an engaging and enlightening chat with prize-winning historian and Emmy Award nominee, professor of religion at Dartmouth, and Detroit Tigers fan, Dr. Randall Balmer. Dr. Balmer previously taught American religious history at Columbia University for 27 years and has been a visiting professor at Princeton, Yale, Northwestern, and Emory Universities and in the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. His current book, Bad Faith, Race and the Rise of the Religious Right, is a timely and important work that reveals the fact that race, not abortion, was a key issue in the birth of the alliance between the religious and right-wing politics. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be. Welcome back to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square and where we're happy to intersect with you again. Uh, and my name is Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Church here in London, Ontario. Eat them up, Tigers. I'm Kevin George from uh, St. Aidan's Anglican Church on the northwest corner of London. My name is Ian. I'm a singer, songwriter, producer, editor, and the person who gets this podcast out to your ears. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. He the man. Where's your Tigers gear, Ian? I, if I could just ask before. I Sorry for interrupting, Rob, but where's your Tigers gear? <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't get the memo today. What's, okay, what, what's well, the occasion? Well, uh, Dr. Balmer, uh, Rob will say more, but Dr. Balmer likes yeah. the Tigers, we think. So. Yeah. I see. For those listening to our podcast, you can't see this, but for those watching on YouTube, Kevin and I are sporting the old English D here. Yep, yep. To, to bring in our guest, which we will do in just a little bit. So uh, glad everybody's with us today. And today we are going to be welcoming a uh, historian and priest and professor and author. And we'll be talking a bit about some of the work he's done and some of the writings that he has done. Uh, Dr. Randall Balmer is going to be joining us discussing the rising connections of the religious right and right-wing politics and highlight some of his uh, books, as I say, especially his latest, which is called Bad Faith, Race and the Rise of the Religious Rights. And Kevin is holding that up for our YouTubers uh, and those watching the podcast today. Good. There you go, guys. Awesome. There it is. So we'll uh, welcome in Randall here in just a couple of minutes, Dr. Balmer. And first of all, though, Kevin's going to offer our land acknowledgement. Yes, uh, we would like to acknowledge that the Vickers Crossing is recorded upon the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Lenape Paywalk and Attawandaran peoples on the lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties, uh, 1796, and a Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples, including First Nations, Métis, Inuit, uh, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of this land and vital contributors to our society. We're just a uh, little more than a week away uh, from the time this drops to our first uh, national uh, day of recognition uh, around uh, Indigenous rights right. uh, on September 30th, um, uh, which is formerly known as Orange Shirt Day. I know our church has one coming up this Sunday. If you're going out this weekend, put on orange. Next Thursday, the 30th, be sure to wear orange, even if it's a Tigers thing. In support that's right. of our that's indigenous right. peoples. Yep, yep. We're going to be doing the same in our uh, our parish this Sunday, and uh, take some time at the beginning of the service to to recognize that and uh, and talk a bit more about it. And that's awesome. So, so that's great. Yeah, yeah. All right. We want to say hi to our sponsors today too, of course, to uh, A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family owned and operated. And a big shout out to Dave Mullen and the staff at A. Miller George Funeral Home today. We got a chance to. To chat with Dave and see him. Uh, I haven't seen too much of him in person because of the pandemic, but great right. opportunity to get together uh, last week. So hi to Dave and thanks for all your support. 
I feel like we sort of primed the pump though, right? Because like on a podcast a couple of weeks ago, I said, Dave, we, you know, we need to hear from you. We'd love to have a beer. And then yeah, all of a sudden yeah. he calls and he brought beer. <laughs> he brought beer. <laughs> what a great, what a great guy. So uh, right. many thanks to, uh, to Dave. Of course, we want to offer our thanks as well to Carol Basada of Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, locally loved. Get in there and see Carol today and she'll move your prescriptions over. Say the words Revy Kevy and they'll give you 10% off of everything over the counter. Ooh. And last but certainly not least, you want to say a big thank you to Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Trisha Lister was the wonderful human being that hooked us up with that one. So many thanks to them over there. All right. All right. All right, boys. Uh, now we have a special segment that we got to get to, too, before yep. we bring in our guest today. And this is a little yep. something new here on the Vickers Crossing. A little something that uh, we like to call, hey, 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 Kevin, uh, who, who in the world did you book this week? Well, Rob, it's funny you should ask. Drum roll, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. That's not a drum roll, but. <laughs> okay, who did we book this week? It's funny when you go to get a drum roll on YouTube and you get an ad. I only want to be with you. And who do we want to be with? Philip Yancey, we booked this week, folks. Yes, yes. Philip, Philip Yancey. Yancey. And those of you, many of you will know, is an American author who writes primarily about spiritual issues. He's a bestseller, probably the best-selling spiritual writer of our day. Uh, the publisher reached out to us. He has a memoir coming out. It's mm -hmm. dropping on the 28th of September. And so next week, uh, we will talk to Philip Yancey about his memoir. So that's who in the name of heavens or who in the heck or whatever else you want to say <laughs> we booked this week that's who it is all right that's great we're looking forward to that all right guys should we bring in our guest that we booked today let's do it i think sure. he's here so uh dr balmer uh, dr randall balmer our guest we're gonna bring him into our zoom room here and have a chat dr balmer paging dr randall balmer Dr. Balmer, are you in the room? And we are back here on the Vickers Crossing and so happy to welcome our guest for this week, Dr. Randall Balmer, who is joining us in our Zoom, Zoom room. Dr. Balmer, wonderful to have you with us. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Great. No, we're so happy you're here. You're in, uh, you're in New Hampshire right now. Is that right? That's right. Just yeah. finished teaching my, uh, the summer quarter. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Right. Very good. Very good. Are you, are you in person? Randall, you you doing in person right uh, now? Actually, I, I had a double load. Frankly, I I taught uh, two courses, each of them, both in person and remotely. So okay. I'm still recovering. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I'll bet. Yeah. yeah, I'll bet. And yeah. for our listeners watching on YouTube, we mentioned this in our intro a little bit. Uh, we wore our our old English D for you today. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I appreciate uh, that. Yeah, we got a band yeah. together. We Tiger fans. And... <laughs> That's am right. I am I right in saying that that I read that you've got a book coming up about religion and sport? I do. I when do. is when is that it's, happening? It's coming uh, about a year from now. So um, my best information next September. Oh well, and, we'll get, uh, you'll like you it back. If, oh. if you're if you're at all interested in sports, you're going to like it. Oh, awesome! Uh, awesome. Um, baseball, football, hockey, and basketball. Awesome. We're talking about the origins of each yeah. one and, and, and what they mean, what the, the symbolism behind each one. And uh, awesome. uh, it, it's a lot of fun, right? I nice. feel like there's a book launch episode in this. I yes. think that I yes. think we got to have you on just ahead of time and launch on a day with you. I'd be happy to do it. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Mark it down. <laughs> yeah. Listen, let's just get started by talking about something that's happened in this country yesterday. So sure. uh, we're, we're recording this on Tuesday. It drops tomorrow, Wednesday, You, if you're listening to this now. But um, on, on Monday, September 20th here in, in uh, Canada, we had a federal election. Uh, uh, here's a novel concept. It, it all happened in 35 days, Randall. It, 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 was, it was started and finished in 35 days. <laughs> so, I wish. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, $600 million later, we're in the same place we were when we started, a minority government with roughly the same seat count that we had before of all the major four parties. Um, but anyway, that's not really what I want to ask you. I don't want you to opine on the, on the structure of the parliament in Canada right at the minute. But one of the things of note in this election was the rise of a far right wing party called the People's Party of Canada, where we're seeing a lot of stuff which is very similar to what we heard during Trump's rise to power and so on. There's a lot of vitriol, a lot of anger, a lot of um, xenophobia uh, and Islamophobia, uh, these, these sorts of things. Um, 
there to me there was and there's and there's obvious connections with the religious right because over the course of this 35 day election when we've seen these folks and there was a troop of them that actually followed the prime minister around uh the leader of the liberal party justin trudeau they followed him around southwestern ontario wherever his bus popped up they popped up and yelled obscenities they actually threw rocks at him at one point one guy got charged and he was a he was a party official for the People's Party of Canada. So it's this sort of rise and the anger towards the media, uh, the screaming at the media that they do. And it, it's it's really sort of alarming. Um, but the thread that seemed to be hanging through it was any of the video footage I've watched, um, crosses and scripture sentences and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of religious imagery, icons even. Like, it, it was really interesting to me uh, that just like in the United States with this stuff, there's a very clear thread that runs through it. The leader of the New Democratic Party here in Canada is Jagmeet Singh. He's a Sikh. Um, I know, uh, having worked on the local NDP candidates campaign just yesterday, out getting the vote out, one of our people was yelled at by a PPC supporter because we supported a quote unquote terrorist uh, raghead who should go back where he comes from. Um, th th this sort of language and, and, and behavior is disturbing. So it's that connection. And what I get from your writing, having read these books of yours, which are fantastic, um, I shouldn't be alarmed at all, probably, right? At the connection between <laughs> between the religious stuff and this sort of right wing politics. Can you reflect for us a little on this sort of unholy union, this happy marriage between the religious right and extreme right politics that we're seeing? And it almost feels a little bit like it's splashing over out of a tub from the United States, you know, into into <laughs> into here. I mean, not because you created it, because I think it's there, but. I think something, the lid's been blown off something here in this election that we've not seen before, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. The splashing over has never happened before, has it? And, no, and, no, yeah, no, no, it's no. happened Canadian. before. Do you remember, um, do you remember the senior Trudeau said to Ronald Reagan that, uh, that being in relationship with the United States was like sleeping next to an elephant, that it's a magnificent beast, but you feel it's every twitch and snore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm sure. I, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> And I apologize for no, that. No, no, I, no. I'm, no. I'd be more funnier than anything. We got our own problems, yeah. believe me. Oh, I understand. No, I, and what you were just describing reminds me of the shortest <laughs> book or verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. he, mm -hmm. and Jesus certainly must be weeping when he sees this sort of action and behavior. And frankly, it's not simply North America. It's not simply no. the United States and Canada. You look at what's happening with yeah. uh, these far right parties and in Europe and other places in the world. And yeah. it's become, as you pointed out, almost formulaic, I think. Uh, yeah. You have the, you know, the anti-immigrant thing, and then you have it uh, wedded with, uh, with the cross and other religious symbols. And of course, we saw it uh, rather dramatically in January 6th with the, yeah. um, the terrorist, uh, the domestic terrorist assault on the, on the US Capitol. And it's, it's hard to figure out. I, I think um, there, there's got to be some sort of rhetoric or some sort of ideology of displacement that's going on. People feel as though their world is crumbling, that their uh, hegemonic hold on society, which probably was never there to begin mm -hmm. with, but nevertheless, uh, there's, there's a powerful nostalgia that's being invoked by very crafty political leaders and, and, and no one craftier really than... <laughs> yeah. And then Donald Trump uh, with that sort of yeah. and his ability to exploit that sense of, of displacement. And, and, you know, just on the face of it, the uh, someone who claims to be a billionaire being a, a populist spokesman, of course, is just... <laughs> That's pretty rich. <laughs> That's rich. <laughs> no pun intended, it's very rich. Yeah. Very rich. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. That, that, that's uh, it's, it's a good way to put it. So the, I think there's some sense of displacement. I think one, one you know, very shorthand explanation for the re religious right is that a lot of people felt displaced, felt as yeah. though uh, their hegemony on society was uh, being eclipsed by, you know, whatever, fill in the blank, and, and they filled in several blanks, of course. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's very sad. And, and frankly, I, th I find it blasphemous. Yeah, it is. A, it's, a, it's a shocking thing. I mean, for people to be out screaming, you know, um, hang him, you know, he's a yeah. tyrant and all this stuff, you know, it's just, it's, it's a madness, a certain brand of madness. I, I, yeah. Well, kind of keeping on that thread of uh, uh, spilling out of the tub. <laughs> and uh, uh, certainly white evangelicals have become a force in the U.S., as we've talked about and Kevin's talked about, and to a lesser degree here in Canada. 
Um, there are those of us though, that, that will, you know, want to shy away to want to call ourselves evangelicals. Um, I mean, scripture certainly calls us to be evangelists. Um, sure. and, and certainly you've, you've not been shy about, um, identifying as evangelical with qualification. And I wanted to read um, a little bit from one of your books, um, Thy Kingdom Come, How the Religious Right Distorts Faith and Threatens America. And you write this, I write as a jilted lover, the evangelical faith that nurtured me as a child and sustains me as an adult has been hijacked by right-wing zealots who have distorted the gospel of Christ, defaulted on the noble legacy of 19th century evangelical activism and fail to appreciate the genius of the First Amendment. They appear not to have read the same New Testament that I open before me every morning at the kitchen counter. And uh, yeah, th I mean, that's a head scratcher, isn't it, for, yeah, for us true. too? I mean, what, what are you reading here? <laughs> You're reading um, the same manuscript? Yeah, Is this yeah. the same thing? <laughs> but uh, uh, Randall, you offer a three-part definition of what constitutes a true evangelical. Could you share with our listeners a little bit more about this definition and, and maybe share with us your own um, your own evangelical credentials, if you will. <laughs> okay, sure. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, yeah I, I think, um, well, you, you, you alluded to it. I, the, the term uh, comes from the, the New Testament, it refers uh, spe specifically back to the evangelists, the four writers of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so uh, the term evangelical refers to the gospel or the good news of salvation, which is uh, recorded in, in the gospels in the first four books of, of the New Testament as well as the rest of the New Testament, I think. So uh, that is you know, the, the proper long-term definition. And then of course, in the, in the 16th century with Martin Luther, Luther's Protestant Reformation, you had the term evangelical re, uh, being associated with the uh, Luther's so-called rediscovery of the gospel mm -hmm. and um, associated very much with Protestantism. I think in America, in, in North America, uh, evangelicalism emerged with uh, or, or really became defined by three strands that came together in what historians call the Great Awakening of the uh, 18th century. Um, the vestiges of New England Puritanism, Scots-Irish Presbyterianism, and uh, Continental Pietism. And they came together in this remarkable series of revivals that uh, we call the Great Awakening. And it was refined further, I think, in the Second Great Awakening, which straddled the the uh, decades uh, surrounding the uh, turn of the 19th century. And by the way, Canada is involved in this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, I think there's an argument to be made, and I've never fully done this, and I'm not sure that my career is long enough <laughs> <laughs> to, to nail this down. But I, I think there's a case to be made that the Great Awakening uh, really um, convulsed the Atlantic the uh, the the um, um, Atlantic seaboard. Mm. And then uh, during the Reformation, during the, sorry, during the American Revolution, it arguably went up and, uh, and kind of curled through the maritime, yes. yeah. and then came down again in uh, the Second Great Awakening, right. in uh, the decades surrounding the turn of the, the 19th century. Again, uh, nobody's really nailed that down. But uh, mm -hmm. if I had a second career ahead of me, yeah. I might uh, <laughs> take that on as, as, as a project. But I, you know, to get to the gist of your question, I define evangelicalism really in three parts. And by the way, a lot of historians have made this much more complicated than it needs to be. But right. I think I, I stick with my three-part Trinitarian. I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> An evangelical is somebody who takes the Bible very seriously as God's revelation to humanity, so much so that she or he would be willing to uh, um, interpret it literally, although. Uh, as I've also, also written, evangelicals engaged in what I call the ruse of selective literalism when they come <laughs> to reading the Bible. As does as does all believe, as do all believers, by the way. We all uh, interpret um, you know, selectively. Mm -hmm. uh, second, an evangelical is somebody who believes in the centrality of a conversion or a born again experience that comes from uh, principally from the third chapter of Saint John in the New Testament. When Nicodemus, the, Jesus, the uh, Jew, Jewish leader, comes to Jesus by night because he doesn't want to be seen with Jesus in the daytime, and he asks Jesus how he, Nicodemus, can be uh, um, eligible for heaven, enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus replied, you must be born again, or in some translations, born from above. Mm -hmm. And evangelicals have picked up on this as uh, pointing to a, 
a, a conversion experience, uh, sometimes very dramatic, usually datable. Uh, an evangelical will be able to say, I came to Jesus on June 17th, 1982. I was in the hospital uh, preparing for surgery. My, my uh, roommate read the Bible with me. I decided to give my life to Jesus or become converted, become born right. again. Those are all synonymous terms. And uh, by the way, the narrative I just... Uh, gave you is uh, roughly my own wife's uh, mm. conversion uh, narrative wow. um, you know, before going in for brain surgery in 1982. Wow. It's a whole other story. Yeah. Uh, the third uh, definition of an evangelical is for me uh, uh, obedience to the so-called Great Commission, Jesus' uh, injunction to his followers to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So mm -hmm. an evangelical is somebody who evangelizes, who brings other, others into the faith. Mm -hmm. And those three um, definitions, I think, uh, make up what uh, I would uh, define as an evangelical. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Oh, and you asked for my own. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Your own <laughs> I was going to check you. Yeah, I was going to check right. you, Randall. I was going to go. Uh, You're not getting on with that. We want to okay. know. You call yourself uh, an evangelical. I want to yeah. know why. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I grew up in, Evandale, in an evangelical household, and that's no guarantee, by the way. Evangelicals would be quick to, uh, yeah. to point out that, uh, that uh, there's no generational um, past when it comes to being an evangelical. Ooh. But my father was for 40 years, an evangelical uh, preacher in the Evangelical Free Church of America. Mm. And uh, I honor both his memory and his uh, ministry. I, wow. I, I think very highly of it. I, yeah. uh, I, I don't, no, nothing I've written uh, or said in the last X number of decades uh, right. is meant to distance myself from my father uh, because mm -hmm. I do truly honor him. But my own born again experience, um, I often talk about it as uh, being age three, and I wow. still remember the moment in uh, the parsonage in a small church in southern, rural southern Minnesota, wow. and uh, my parents asking me if I wanted to invite Jesus into my heart, and I did mm. so. And wow. uh, the first of many times, frankly, because, yeah. uh, you know, this is something that uh, is is a source of some anxiety for evangelicals. Have I really done it? Right. Am I really saved? Am I really born again? Right. Uh, part of the, the language, of course, is rededicating one's life to Jesus. And I certainly did that many times uh, growing up. And uh, so I'm very much part of that uh, tradition. It's a tradition that uh, shapes me and uh, has shaped me and continues to shape me. And uh, it's also part of my DNA. So uh, I consider myself very much part of that, uh, that tradition, even though, as you point out, I have sought to distance myself from right. um, dimensions in the movement that I find, uh, well, I'll return to the word blasphemous. Blasphemous, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yeah. okay, well, we that's it. We, yeah. Then you qualify then, okay? So okay, you, you qualify, you. Yeah. okay. I don't have my card. Do you have me, your I'm card? Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't. But, uh, I got to tell you, I, I should say to our listeners that I, this is a turn of phrase that Randall uses in his book, his uh, evangelical credentials. Um, we didn't know. Uh, we, we weren't really <laughs> no, testing them. No. <laughs> so, okay. so we, we actually, I just found it uh, compelling to, to read, actually, that, you know, you were at such a young age when you had that born again experience and that, you know, you, you were raised in such a rich tradition. And, and I think that what you're doing right now in terms of the great commission is really most profound because in many ways, what you're doing is recapturing the real spirit of this good news and trying to push back this blasphemous stuff in a way um, and really embrace something different. So I, I, I really found it to be uh, uh, just, it touched me that, that you have those memories. It's, and just yeah. to hear about your wife earlier. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, look, say the word evangelical today, as we're saying, and, and no doubt most people will think about abortion or homosexuality, right? It's a, it's a big deal. The assumption of many of, uh, many of us make when we uh, listen to this very loud iteration of evangelicals um, is that uh, this has always been the case, that the roots of the movement came from a deep and, and deep and abiding concern for those issues. Um, just uh, when last week uh, Bishop John Shelby Spong died, and he yeah. had, and uh, he had said that uh, he, in referring to this sort of movement, he said it's like a swimming pool; all the noise comes from the shallow end. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
<laughs> that, uh, you, 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 lots of people either liked or didn't like John Shelby Spong for well, a whole bunch of reasons. But the one thing he did do was cause us to discuss. And that to me was a, was a brilliant sort of turn of phrase. It's like, you know, the noise yeah. is in the shallow end of the pool because it's not that deep. <laughs> now, now, now you dispel this myth though, like this myth that it's about abortion and, and homosexuality, that that's sort of the roots of, of uh, evangelical or right wing religious, uh, the religious right um, in, in thy kingdom come and in bad faith, actually. In fact, you remind the reader that according to the New Testament, Jesus himself said nothing about either abortion or homosexuality, at least nothing that survives the New Testament accounts. In bad faith, you suggest that the real catalyst for the religious right was a court case, a court decision in the 1970s. No doubt people listening now will go, oh yeah, Roe versus Wade, right? That's what got this going. Well, it wasn't Roe versus Wade, in fact. It was, uh, it was a lower court ruling in the District of Columbia called Green versus Connolly. Can you tell us about what really happened and about the real origins of the religious right and, sure. and, and, and how all that came about? Yeah, let me preface it by saying that uh, I guess I'm I'm still burnishing my, my evangelical credentials by saying this, but uh, I spent um, I, I spent the, the really the entire uh, 1970s embedded in what I call the evangelical subculture. Mm. That is to say, uh, I was in high school in Des Moines, Iowa. My father was pastor of the Westchester Evangelical Free Church at that time. Mm. So well, the first couple of years of 1970s, I uh, graduated from high school in 1972. I was very much uh, there, certainly. And then I went, went off to an evangelical school at Trinity College in Deerfield, Illinois, for my um, bachelor's degree, and then stayed on that campus effectively and um, was working at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in the development, development department and simultaneously doing an MA part-time in, in church history. So uh, my point in saying that is that I was, I was, <laughs> I was. You were there. You I were there, there, man. <laughs> I was. And so when I started, uh, and then I went out of graduate, uh, to graduate school in 1980. And at that time, I was kind of, um, uh, I, I kind of was indifferent toward evangelicalism. It wasn't that I had left the movement. Uh, I was just, I was no longer interested in the questions they were asking. They, it just kind of, uh, I bored me, frankly. I, I just wasn't really involved that much. And then I started hearing in the early 1980s that abortion was the issue that got this whole religious right movement going. And I said to myself, you know, I was there. I don't really remember that. <laughs> it was not an issue that was, yeah. that was uh, very much on the minds of, of uh, evangelicals, in, certainly in my circles, in the 1970s. Well, fast forward 1990, I guess we're now talking in terms of decades here in yeah. this narrative. Uh, I was invited to uh, this uh, remarkable meeting in Washington, D.C. in November of 1990. And I, I am still not entirely certain why I was invited, but it turned out that this was a closed, closed door meeting in a hotel conference room. And it turns out I discovered when I got there that this was really a, a, a kind of celebration marking the 10 year anniversary of Ronald Reagan's election to the presidency in you know, 10 years earlier in, in November of 1980. Mm -hmm. And so here I find myself in this room and frankly, I hadn't celebrated 10 years earlier. I was no, in no <laughs> yeah, way to celebrate that's right. <laughs> 10 years later. <laughs> well, here I am in the room with all of these, uh, it, it's a who's who of the religious right. Uh, Richard Vigory, the, oh, wow. the conservative direct mail guru, Richard Land from the Southern Baptist Convention, Donald Wildman, the Ooh. founder of the American Family Association, Ed Dobson, who was one of oh. uh, um, Ed, uh, uh, Jerry Falwell's uh, acolytes right, right. At, 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 in, in, at Moral Majority, uh, Ralph Reed, head of the Christian Coalition, Carl F.H. Henry, the editor-in-chief of uh, the founding editor of Christianity Today <laughs> magazine. Very and, diverse sounding group you're, de you're yeah. describing. Yeah. <laughs> all, all men, by the way. All, yeah. all, all white men, by the yeah. too. Right? All white men, yeah. 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 <laughs> And Paul Weyrich, who was really the architect of the religious right. And I, you know, I, I knew all these names, certainly. And, you know, <laughs> let, let's put it this way. These were not people I was used to hanging out with. Let's, right. You didn't right. go to the Tiger. Yeah. You didn't go to the Tigers game with these guys? <laughs> <laughs> no. I didn't. And in, in the first session, Paul Weyrich, who, as I said, is, is the architect of the, the religious right, the kind of um, evil genius behind the whole movement. Mm. 
he he made it, he he kind of uh, he was a bit of a grandstander as as you might uh, suggest I might guess he said let's remember this movement did not come into being in opposition to abortion mm. and he went on and on at some time about this and almost immediately Ed Dobson who uh, was there uh, with religious right the formation of, of moral majority uh, agreed he concurred with what uh, what Weirich was saying and so. Uh, the, the discussion went on and there was a break immediately thereafter before the next session. I went up to Weirich and I said, I want to make sure I understand you correctly. Abortion had nothing to do with the genesis of this movement. He said, absolutely not. He said, I've been trying since the Goldwater campaign in 1964 to get evangelicals mobilized as a political uh, movement. He said, I tried the school prayer issue. I tried uh, women's rights issue. I tried pornography issue. I tried abortion. Nothing got their attention until the IRS started coming after these um, segregated institutions, evangelical institutions in the 1970s. Mm. Uh, so I may have it directly from, from uh, Paul Weirich. So anyway, that kind of got me started on a multi, dare I say, decade quest <laughs> to find out uh, the real origins of, of the religious right, which took me to the archives at Bob Jones University, the archives at Liberty University, Jerry Falwell's place, um, Mm. several presidential libraries, mm. and uh, to uh, Paul Weirich's personal papers, which are in all places uh, at uh, the University of Wyoming in Laramie, Wyoming. Wow. And so, yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, that's, that's a longer story. But, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the upshot, uh, the, the payoff is, and I can say this without fear of contradiction. Mm -hmm. The religious right did not get started in opposition to the Roe v. Wade ruling of 1973. And I'll just provide a little bit more, a little sure. bit more ballast to the argument if I can, mm -hmm. uh, can do this. I know I'm going on and on here. You, your time, our time is your time, Randall. Okay. Um, 1968. Christianity Today, the flagship magazine of evangelicalism, together with another evangelical group called the Christian Medical Society, convened a conference and invited all you know these the heavyweight evangelical theologians to discuss the morality surrounding abortion. They met for several days, uh, hashed over the issue, and at the end, they couldn't decide whether or not abortion was a moral issue that evangelicals should be concerned about. In fact, they issued a statement. I don't have it in front of me, uh, but it's the statement said, uh, we can't decide, uh, I'm paraphrasing, of course, here. I, we can't decide, but we think that abortion should, should be allowed. The Southern Baptist Convention, not exactly known as a redoubt of liberalism. No, no. Passed a resolution at their meeting in St. Louis, 1971, calling for the legalization of abortion, which they reaffirmed wow. in 1974, the year after Roe v. Wade, and wow. again in 1976. Wow. When the ruling was handed down, several prominent evangelicals, including W.A. Criswell, pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, who was also sometime president of the Southern Baptist Convention, issued statements applauding the Roe v. Wade decision. Wow. Mm. Jerry Falwell, by his own admission, did not preach his first anti-abortion sermon until February of 1978. Wow. That's more than five years after. after the Roe v. Wade decision. Wow. So I, I'm just, I mean, I, yeah. I could go on forever, but yeah. But um, well, that's, that's interesting. It's, it's inter <laughs> well, yes, but it's interesting context because I think most people don't realize the, like these, these facts about you know, all this sort of, particularly 68 and 73 or 72, writing these, you know, policy in church about supporting abortion. I don't think most Christians are aware no, of no, all that. No. Anyway, pardon the interruption. Continue. No, no. I mean, well, no, the point is, and I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and I'll, I'm happy to go on, but uh, the point is evangelicals regarded abortion as a Catholic issue throughout the 1970s. Right. And it wasn't until very late in the 1970s that uh, abortion uh, was even on the radar screen. So, so what was Green versus Connolly? So Green versus Connolly was um, a lower court decision at the District Court for the District of Columbia. And uh, the background is that in Green County, Mississippi, the first year of uh, uh, integration of the public schools. Mm -hmm. The number of white students in the public schools dropped from over 700 to 28. 
Mm. Wow. The second year of desegregation, the number of white students in Greene County, Mississippi dropped to zero. Wow. At the same time, several whites only segregation academies, uh, tragically church sponsored, yes. applied to the Internal Revenue Service for tax exempt status. And several families in Holmes County, Mississippi said, wait a minute, this isn't right. Yeah. And so they filed suit, now uh, that suit, and you know, uh, the judicial system works its way up through the courts. And uh, it was joined with another suit, finally came up before the um, District Court for the District of Columbia. And on June 30th, 1971, the District Court for the District of Columbia issued a ruling saying, uh, in effect, that any institution that engages in racial segregation or racial discrimination is not by definition a charitable institution. Mm. And for that reason has no claims on tax exempt status. Mm. And as the IRS began to enforce that ruling throughout the 1970s, that got the attention of Jerry Falwell who had his own segregation academy in Lynchburg, Virginia, yeah. formed in 1967 during the desegregation of the public schools. Right and other uh, religious leaders, evangelical leaders. And that is what brought them together to form this movement, uh, this political movement we call the religious right, had right. nothing whatsoever to yeah, do with to do with that. Yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, there's no pretty way to say this. This was a movement that has its roots in a defense of racial segregation. That's, you, you, you can't yeah. prettify it. That's, yeah. that's what it was. Yeah. 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 Um, um, uh, gosh, wait too long. What's wrong with me, guys? We had him on the podcast. Yeah, uh, Robert, Robert, Jones, Robert yeah. Jones. Robert writes yeah. about this as well. It's it's mm -hmm. just you know. I mean, it's incredible right. to think how how and how ignorant many of us are about what the real roots of all this are. Yeah, no, yeah. this is really interesting well, I, stuff. I, I, mean, I, I think the reason for that, and 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 you're absolutely right about that. But the reason for that is that the, the leaders of this movement have just relentlessly. Um, well, frankly, prevaricated on, about this yeah. and, and said, uh, this is what uh, opposition to abortion is what got us going as a political movement. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's a lie. I mean, it's a mendacious, it's, yes. it's both yeah. audacious yeah. and mendacious. mendacious. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's certainly been a, a, I guess you could call it a happy marriage between this religious right and uh, also uh, he sh who shall not be named, but we will anyway, uh, <laughs> Donald Trump. So this marriage yeah. has taken place and it is deeply troubling. And you write um, something in uh, Bad Faith, um, which Kevin alluded to, your latest book, by the way, right? Uh, Ra uh, Race and the Rise of the Religious Right. And there it is. We're holding it up for our YouTube viewers Thank to you. see. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so yeah, just a quote from the book. Um, you wrote, I have often defended evangelicals against the charge of racism, but the results of the 2016 presidential election, when 81% of white evangelicals voted for Trump, forced me to reconsider and to see the history of the religious right in a new light. Whereas I have once believed that a commitment to family values and opposition to abortion had indeed replaced racism at the core of the movement, I now suspect otherwise. Uh, yeah, so, sometimes I think the patron saint of the religious right uh, is Ronald Reagan. Yeah, sure. um, and, and you could take us back to the 70s and, and the 1980 presidential election. If we look at that, I mean, how is it that evangelicals turned their backs on Jimmy Carter at the time, a Sunday school teacher, a born again Christian, right, a white southerner, and they elect uh, a divorced and remarried former governor of California. The two don't seem to click. No, exactly. And again, I, I lived through this. This is, uh, you know, this yeah. is, um, I, I was very much part of this. And, and I, it, it, it puzzled me at the time, frankly. I mean, I, I'm not going to deny Jimmy Carter had his own uh, sure. uh, difficulties. Sure. I think anybody, sure. frankly, anybody who was president in the late 1970s would uh, probably be a one-term president. It was just a terrible time. Yeah. What, was in, what, what was in, interest was like 28% or something. Like interest rates. Yeah, I mean, interest rates were in the 20s. In, and, inflation and, was sort of roof. I mean, who the heck? In, inflation was yeah. out of control. Yeah. You had the taking of the hostages in Iran. Yes, all you had Iran, Three yeah. Mile Island, the nuclear. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I remember yeah. the lineups at the pumps, right? The, the news watching over it, in, in this. Terrible. Yeah. Lined up for, yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 It, was, it was just a horrible 
full time to, to be president. So I'm, I'm not discounting the fact that Jimmy Carter had his political problems uh, in, in the late 1970s. But what uh, has become clear to me in my research is that there was a, um, an underground, you know, very conservative effort, a concerted effort rather, conservative as well, uh, uh -huh. to uh, deny him re-election in 1980. And I'm, I, I, I'm sorry to say Billy Graham played a big role in that, yeah. uh, that, that effort, uh, along with a bunch of others. But um, uh, yeah, uh, you, you're absolutely right. And, and actually, in writing Bad Faith, um, I was able to kind of find the missing link. Um, that is to say, I, I had determined again I, I i say this without fear of contradiction uh the, the movement began in opposition to racial integration mm -hmm. at evangelical institutions in the 1970s and then we come to donald trump in 2016 oh, what boy. was the missing yeah and you know i on the face of it i think you can explain it that is to say that uh the 2016 election allowed the religious right finally to circle back to its its charter um purpose, which was defense of racial segregation. So, you know, I don't think there's much, um, much debate about that uh, Donald Trump is, is, is racist. Uh, I mean, I guess we can talk about that. But You're not going to get a debate here. Let's put it that okay. way. <laughs> right. uh, so, you know, what was the connection between the two? And, and you know, initially I thought, well, it's just kind of circling back to the origins of the movement. And, and, and that's, that's simply true. But I also came to see that Ronald Reagan really, as you say, the patron saint of the religious right, yeah. uh, was in many ways the missing link here. And right. just a, a bit of evidence here, uh, just as Donald Trump got his start in politics by denying Barack Obama's nativity, yes, yeah. that is to say yeah. his, uh, that he was born in the United States, uh, Ronald Reagan got his start in politics by opposing the Rumford Fair Housing Act in California mm. in 1964, mm, wow. which aimed, aimed to provide equality in both the rental of housing as well as the purchase uh, of, of housing. Uh, Ronald Reagan was a vocal opponent of both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Mm. Uh, throughout his political campaigns, he frequently invoked the racially charged phrase, law and order. Law and order, campaign. there it is, yeah. yeah. And who can forget his vile caricature of these mythical welfare queens, yes. women yeah. of color yeah. who supposedly are living the high life off of the public dole. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's that's part of who he was. And for yeah. me, the clincher, and even if none of that, <laughs> yes. none of that was true, for me, the clincher was August 3rd, 1980. Ronald Reagan opened his general election campaign for the presidency. He had just won the Republican nomination. Yeah. Kicks off his fall general election campaign and he goes to, of all places in the United States of America, he goes to Philadelphia, Mississippi, mm. the place where 16 summers earlier, members of the Ku Klux Klan, in collusion with the local sheriff's department, abducted, tortured, and killed three civil rights workers, mm. two Jews, one African-American. Wow. And he goes to the Neshoba County Fair. And then this is a man who's the master of symbolism. Yes. And lest anyone miss his meaning in that speech at the Neshoba County Fair in, you know, I, I just, yeah, it, it boggles my mind. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia, Mississippi. Yeah. He invokes the age old segregationist battle cry, yeah. states yeah. rights. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ronald yeah. Reagan is the missing link. He's yes, the missing link between the origins of the wow. religious right and Donald Trump in 2016, and again, of course, in 2020. And you know, uh, the 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 parenthesis here mm -hmm. is that evangelicals turned their back on one of their own in 1980. They turned their right. back on a Southern yeah. Baptist Sunday school teacher. Yeah. Yep. Still married to the same. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Imagine that. What are we now? Like eighty? They must be married almost eighty years now. Yeah. I think yeah. it's. I think it's. They just seventy-eight or something. Just, just yeah. recently. It's, yeah. it's, it's quite, a, quite amazing. I, and by the way, I, as as I'm sure you know, I wrote a biography yeah. of Jimmy Carter, um, and I can tell you uh, 
that marriage is solid. Solid <laughs> as a rock. Yeah. yeah, we're going to have more on that in a bit too. Yeah. So um, it's on the face of it, it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. But if you dig down a little bit deeper, I, I'm, I'm afraid that you know this sort of racist infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, has been there um, all along. Yeah. Was it, something that I only came to see really in writing this book. Was it not Ronald Reagan who first used to turn a phrase, make, uh, make America great again? He did, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, wow. and uh, yeah, that's a connection as well. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, and, and this to go back to this people party in Canada, their, the color they chose was purple. So I, what was interesting to watch was the purple hats with make Canada great again on the front. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's <laughs> not even, it's not even like they're trying yeah. to disguise yeah. their love. Yeah. Not even stuff. trying to sneak it <laughs> in. Yeah. It's, it's like, Over to anyway, Ian. Ian. Ian wanted to kind of get a question it, into. Uh, you make the case that a part of the collateral damage of the abortion myth, going, circling back to abortion, I guess, uh, and the uh, alliance of the evangelicalism with the hard right elements of the Republican party is a, I'm going to struggle with this word, but is a ossification. You got it, Pontiac. Nice. Ossification, ossification yeah. of the debate over abortion itself. Yeah. Uh, it, it has become a dualistic argument. This in, this in turn has led to single issue voting. Uh, the single issue voting on abortion makes white evangelicals complicit in a, in, a, in a whole range of policies that are inconsistent with the 19th century evangelical reformers and with the Bible. Yeah. Um, now, in bad faith, you write, how is a ruthless exclusionary policy towards immigrants and refugees in any way consistent with scriptural mandate to welcome the stranger and treat the foreigner as one of your own? How does environmental destruction and indifference to climate change honor God's creation? Um, you go on to say evangelical positions on poverty, poverty, race, racial injustice, injustice, excuse me, women's equality or access to health care should surely be cal calibrated with Jesus, with Jesus and Jesus's injunction, yeah. injunction to care for the widows and orphans to feed the hungry and clothe and clothe the naked. And with Paul's declaration that in Christ, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. Um, you go on to write, I'm not asking white evangelicals to abandon their opposition to abortion, even though I believe many of those efforts are misdirected, but abortion should be considered in a larger context, and the path of healing lies in facing the past and dealing with, its for dealing with it forthrightly. Repentance, in my experience, is good for the soul. Mine um, too. <laughs> can you say more about the night? more about 19th century evangelicalism and do you have hope that the religious right will repent and take up a fresh reading of jesus call to care for at least <laughs> for at least of these i love you guys you quote myself that's that's, that's <laughs> well I, listen buddy I, that's I, why we're here <laughs> we gotta and know I hear and I said, I say, gee, did I write? That's pretty good, actually. Did I write that <laughs> it's, stuff? It's yeah. really good. I'm pretty we good. We get that a lot. We get that a lot. People say, did I write that? And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty good stuff. You did a good job. It's, it's really well done. Yeah. yeah. Those are Ian. Those are good questions. Uh, uh, so, first of all, for 19th century evangelicalism, and and this for me is part of the 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 contrast. You know, I look at the agenda of the religious right, right? You know, anti-immigration now, anti-vaxxing, which is just, I mean, just. Yeah, but it's a whole other yeah. well, that, that's, <laughs> well that was and by the way that was the whole bailiwick of this ppc here in canada was anti-lockdown anti-backs anti yeah. anti anti yeah. anyway yeah you know i think I, and 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 most of these people are are too old or too young rather to remember yeah. you know, the polio epidemic and and you yeah. know i i mean all of us went to school with an uh, immunization I, I, card right we had we had to show i had the yellow card did you have the yellow card I had the yellow well, card. It wasn't yellow for us, but you know, it's, uh, anyway, that's a whole other topic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ian asked about 19th century evangelicalism, uh, and this is one of the things that that uh, I began to learn about really back in the in the 1970s, when I was very much uh, within the evangelical subculture, and I looked at at uh, the sort of social agenda that uh, defined evangelicals and really defined much of the nation for the 19th mm -hmm. century. It was quite amazing. And uh, almost invariably, evangelical social action, social reform, took the part of those on the margins of society, yeah. those who were dispossessed in some way, those who were um, uh, those who were not part of the 
uh, of the 1%, as we say these yes. days in, in yeah. talking about economics. So for example, evangelicals uh, were very much in favor of public education, what were called uh, common schools in the 19th century, mm -hmm. because they saw this and they were very explicit about this. This was a way for the children of those who are left, less affluent to become upwardly mobile. So right. they could join the middle class. Uh, being educated was very important. They understood that. And, and again, they were very explicit about that. They were uh, involved in various peace crusades. Now, the Civil War kind of um, tore that to shreds, but yeah. uh, up until the Civil War, M. Jeffers were very much involved in, in uh, those peace crusades. And by the way, I've even uh, run across an instance of evangelical, uh, an evangelical organization devoted to gun control in the, in the 19th century. Mm. Wow. Uh, that was an evangelical cause. Uh, they were very much uh, Northerners, of course, involved in uh, the fight against slavery. Now, I am not going to deny that there were some evangelical uh, theologians in the South who defended slavery. I'm sure. sure. It, that's very clear. I, I, don't, I don't deny that a bit. But if you look at, all, uh, at the overall record, the overall agenda, and you plotted it against some sort of contemporary political spectrum, there's no question mm -hmm. that evangelicalism would, would lean far to the left on any contemporary political spectrum, certainly in the case of, of women's rights and according rights to uh, uh, minorities as well. Evangelicals were very much concerned with those on the margins of society. Yeah. Not perfectly, I'm not going to make any such claims. Uh, much of their activity was uh, would be considered paternalistic or even colonialist by today's right. standards. But overall, and, and again, the, the disjunction between that and you know, this agenda that coming out of the religious right today is uh, for me just uh, so, uh, so jolting yeah. that uh, I, I, it's hard for me to take in. Mm. So I think that was the first part of your question. And you had a second part too. Please. Uh, yes, it was. Do you have hope that these religious right oh, will <laughs> repent and take up a fresh reading of Jesus? I, I, I note now for those of you listening and not watching that Randall sat back in his chair when they said the word hope. <laughs> <laughs> well i you know i i think you have to be hopeful i i think i've i i made this claim i think in in a previous book or at least in response to a previous book i think anyone who is a parent has to be hopeful uh, you, you, i as a parent i don't have the luxury of despair i have mm. to try to uh, to to make this world a better place and uh right it's awfully tempting to throw up your hands and say no yeah uh, there's no hope but i i just don't think that i, I don't think that's an option frankly um so um with evangelicalism i you know i think i write in the book that uh you know if you believe in as i do in in, in the gospels in the new testament that uh, jesus raised lazarus from the dead even though he mm. begun his body had begun to decay right. yeah <laughs> And if Jesus can do that, Jesus can Jesus can um, reclaim evangelicalism. That yeah. said, I have to add that I think the movement has become um, so distorted that it's almost beyond recognition. And mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, if there's any hope, Ian, it's for you and your generation. Uh, that is, a younger generation of evangelicals are coming up and they're saying wait a minute, something's yeah. wrong here. Yeah. And I think those voices are awfully important. And if I have any realistic hope in the future of evangelicalism, it lies with the younger generation. Now, I think there's also an argument to be made that maybe this is a, a movement that is, you know, it's it's spent as wad. It's, 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 mm -hmm. it's uh, maybe past reclamation and and we should look elsewhere for uh, spiritual guidance and for a community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I find that uh, in, you know, in the Anglican tradition, certainly. Yeah, and yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, even as I've been careful not to renounce my evangelical yeah. roots or my evangelical credentials, um, uh, a, a richer liturgical tradition uh, connected with uh, history um, takes seriously the notion of the communion of the saints. Right. Um, mm -hmm. is awfully important to me. And mm -hmm. um, at the same time, while I, I say that, I recognize that, uh, that uh, not, all, um, not all evangelicals will find that as a, a congenial <laughs> yeah, pathway. Right. But right. Uh, yeah. that for me has become uh, my community. Yeah. But just going from those young people you're talking about, and I think there are, I mean, like some of the folks we've had, we had uh, last week, Drew Jackson on here, a young poet, 
Uh, mm -hmm. The stuff that he's writing, he just released his book. It's just incredible. It's called the God Speaks Through Wombs. And this is a, mm -hmm. a young pastor in his 30s in, um, in New York from New Jersey, um, talking about his experience yeah. as a black body in, in, and, and yeah. what that's like amazing yeah. prophet and he said last week when we talked to him at his book launch special was that when he talked about the people who are coming up now as you were just talking about them he said they're the young people who are in the streets um yeah. that they're they're speaking with their feet uh is is yeah. what he said that it's uh that, you know there's a word being spoken and it's being mm -hmm. spoken not necessarily within our the halls of our churches mm -hmm. but out on our streets right so yeah. and in, um, and in, and from the margins you that's know, right very to that much from the margins yeah, yeah that's right, yeah, that's right. Um, as, as i think jesus jesus probably had a, fits it, that description probably too. Had a thing well, that's the thing yeah had a, had a thing or two to say about that so 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 to the young people from the young people to what you had said earlier about that you know 77 or eight year marriage of of uh, rosalind and, and jimmy carter right uh there's an evangelical who's never lost focus um on his faith your book uh, redeemer is fantastic a beautiful biography if i could recommend it to people uh of uh, of jimmy carter it's great insight uh and what i like about this biography and i've read uh you know a couple of his because i really admire jimmy carter um yeah. is that you you do take time to actually unpack um how his evangelical faith plays such a large role in his life as it did for him as a businessman, as a governor, as a president, as a humanitarian, um, as a Sunday school teacher, as, you know, a Nobel prize winner, whenever I, I watch him, you watch him on late night TV in his nineties for heaven's sakes. And he's exuding what you'd hope somebody could mm -hmm. show what it looks like. You talk about preaching the good news just by who you are. You write of it. You write of him. Um, the life of Jimmy Carter is the story of how a son of the South, a Baptist, schooled in the scriptures from an early age, transcended the prevailing social and ra racial attitudes of his time and place, not always perfectly or seamlessly, but determinedly. He was, a, uh, he was catapulted to the highest office in the land by an electorate weary of political corruption, intrigued by the notion of a new post-racial South, and enamored, however briefly, of Carter's evangelical restitute. He took the principles of progressive evangelicalism with him to Washington and sought with mixed success to govern by those lights. Four years later, betrayed by many of his own faith, he suffered a stinging political loss. And from the ashes of defeat, Jimmy Carter returned to the South and rehabilitated himself as a citizen of the world, devoting himself to the causes of peace, justice, and the eradication of suffering. My gosh, it's so true. I mean, so many people who would have spoken, even people who would have spoken politically ill of him for all those reasons we talked about earlier, economically and so on, have come to truly admire uh, Jimmy yeah. Carter. And he's made alliances across party lines in, in you know, his post-presidency. Um, yeah. are, are there any... Are there any evangelicals like Jimmy Carter on the political landscape today? Like, I mean, this is the question I have. I mean, I, I see now that uh, Raphael Warnock, Reverend Warnock has been yeah. elected. Yeah. I think of him. I think of what Stacey Abrams did in getting him and others. I mean, I think her ground game was just amazing. And that was, to me, yeah. a faith response, not a political response. Um, so are there progressive evangelicals stepping up today, I guess, to pick up on what we were saying earlier about our young people and so on? Yeah, first of all, I, I, I think I can claim Raphael Warnock as a former student, actually. Oh, really? All right. <laughs> oh, wow. I knew I liked the guy. I knew I liked the guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he's, he, I think he's the real thing. I mean, he's really quite, quite remarkable. No. Um, uh, will white evangelicals you know, fall in line? I, you know, I, yeah. I'm yes. skeptical. <laughs> it's, it's, it is Georgia. It is, it is Georgia. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. Uh, I, I really don't know about that. Um, others, I don't know. I, I, I don't immediately see other names on the horizon, but maybe mm -hmm. I'm not tapped into it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things, and, and your, your, your question really points to a, a real problem uh, for, for progressive evangelicals, is who do who do we look to as role models these days? Well, Jimmy mm -hmm. Carter, I mean, Jimmy Carter is well, yeah. he's not easy. And, and yeah. uh, you know, he's, he's not, not going to make a political <laughs> comeback no, um, at, at this point. And uh, as much as I admire him, uh, but who else? Well, uh, actually my next project is a biography of Mark Hatfield, who oh. um, also, uh, is deceased, 
uh, Stanley, uh, but uh, had a remarkable 30 year career in the US Senate, uh, an evangelical, a Baptist, Republican, and probably the last liberal Republican in the United States of America mm. uh, was Mark Hatfield. And uh, he is a, I think, a powerful role model. One of the reasons I want to write the book is to provide that role model for, for evangelicals alongside of, uh, of Jimmy Carter. But uh, you know, once you go through a couple of names like that, where do you go? The bench mm. is pretty, pretty short, I think. Uh, and I, I, I hope I'm wrong about that. Maybe I'm missing a whole new generation out there that is about to kind of break through, but I, I'm not aware of them, to, to be honest. I just, the last one I think of is just listening to him talk about his faith a little bit nowadays is uh, Adam Kinzinger, but, I, but they're going to... Yeah. They're going to crucify him, right? Like the Republicans oh, yeah, are going to, yeah, they're going to, yeah. they're, he'll, he'll never, like he's done. His goose is cooked, yeah, you know, but, yeah. but he's had the courage to stand up and write and say things about his faith, compelling him to do what he's done in terms of yeah. opposing and voting for impeachment yeah. and so on. And, right. uh, and all they've done with that is rip him to shreds. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I think, um, Frankly, I had hopes for John Thune, a Democratic, mm. I'm sorry, Republican senator from South Dakota. I mean, he, yeah. he's he's a graduate of Biola. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I want to take him aside and say, yeah, I've never <laughs> met him, but <laughs> yeah. say, you should know better. I mean, that's right. That's right. Well, don't worry, Randall. He listens to us. So <laughs> <laughs> no worries. He'll hear that message. You hear that, John? <laughs> We're disappointed in you, John. <laughs> we are disappointed in you. Um, He's waiting hey, to hear from Ian. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Ian's going to go after. Uh, let's let's just finish up today. I know uh, you've been very generous with, with your time, Randall, and we want to get you on your way. But just to, just to finish up, I asked you a question um, and I wanted to just give a quote. Um, from another one of your your wonderful books, which is called called God in the White House, a history of how faith shaped the presidency from John F. Kennedy to George W. Bush. And you write this important note of, of caution. My reading of American religious history is that religion always functions best from the margins of society and not in the councils of power. Once you identify the faith with a particular candidate or party or with the quest for political influence, Ultimately, it is the faith that suffers. Compromise may work in politics. It's less appropriate to the realm of faith and belief. Our focus always on the podcast is to try to hold up and look at that intersection between faith and the public square, which can be a delicate dance because we know, as we, as we mentioned, Christianity does has its, have its very, its very origins in the margins. Um, and while engaging politics and being an activist for a better world for everyone is critical, can you say a bit more about the danger of forgetting that, you know, that anti-imperial message that Jesus yeah. did have and the need to be cautious and not kind of be co-opted or compromised by political parties? Yeah, I think, and, and, and that warning goes all the way back to Roger Williams. Uh, and yeah. Roger Williams is the, really the progenitor of the metaphor, uh, the garden of the church in the wilderness of world and the wilderness of the world need to be separated by a, a wall or a wall of separation and i think what people miss in that metaphor is that for people like roger williams and others in the 17th century uh, they weren't members of the sierra club <laughs> they weren't <laughs> they, they didn't uh, share our post therovian yes idealization of wilderness so for them wilderness was a place of danger where evil lurked and so when he's talking about separating the garden of the church from the wilderness of the world, what he's really trying to say is, if you want to maintain the integrity of the faith, mm -hmm. don't intermix it with politics or don't right. intermix it with the state. And I have to say, I think that's the genius of religion in America and mm -hmm. Canada to some degree as well, because there's, there's some commonalities mm -hmm. there is that you don't have, we don't have, you don't have uh, a state church. You don't have an established religion. And that has set up a kind of free marketplace for religion where religion flourishes as nowhere else really in the world, uh, here in North America, it seems to me. But Roger Williams was warning that the integrity of the faith was compromised by too close an association with politics. Yeah. And I stand by the statement that you read, I, and I, I, I've made it many times actually, that I think that uh, religion always functions best from the margins of society. Society, when you begin to uh, um, crave or covet, I'm using these 
these words kind of covets covets a great word for it yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. political power and political influence Mm -hmm. you lose your prophetic voice and so it's always good to maintain a distance it seems to me and and remain uh and 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 to sustain the role of prophet and uh, lord knows and again i use that phrase advisedly Mm -hmm. as well Mm -hmm. lord knows we need prophets today Mm -hmm. we need people calling us back to the faith keeping it keep it People calling us back to the truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, I mean, need, you even think of that uh, in in relationship with Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. You know, in four years, according to the Washington Post, uh, he made thirty thousand five hundred yeah. <laughs> some odd false or misleading statements. You know, yeah. and and yet evangelicals fall all over themselves oh, yeah. uh, supporting this guy and, and the hits you know, just keep on coming apparently oh, yeah. he, oh, well, he hasn't I mean, stopped yes. since he's left <laughs> off you know he, he, he actually provided a job for a canadian so so if you're a cnn watcher and you've watched daniel dale truth a uh, fact check uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, donald yeah. trump so daniel dale was a columnist with the toronto star and yep. somehow or another he, he started running this uh, in the toronto star these uh, uh, fact checks on, on yeah. donald trump yeah. And yeah. CNN caught wind of it, and they ended up hiring yeah. him to go. So he's got a whole career. <laughs> it's unbelievable. At yeah. a, at a post, post-truth America. Yeah. So. <laughs> unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, hey. it's, it's, you know, and, yeah. and, and, you know, again, telling the truth, I think, is a very important function in, uh, in society. And uh, I especially, think people of faith are called to tell the truth. And sometimes the truth is not comfortable. That's right. Especially in a world of alternate facts, right? Because yeah. the echo chamber now is you make your own facts and you believe your own facts yeah. and and that's that yeah. so exactly. you know exactly yeah. well randall hey we really appreciate you spending the time with us today it's been uh really enlightening a lot of stuff to 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 digest what you said i've really found it fascinating and uh want to uh, make sure our listeners, uh, I'm going to get Kevin to hold up the book again. Because, yeah. And uh, I'll mention, wanna... I'll mention a couple that we've quoted here today yeah, too, Rob. Yeah. So, so, so this, is, this is Randall's most recent book right here. There it is there. Bad faith, race, and the rise of the religious, right? And yeah, what were the other ones? Uh, and Kevin? so you'll be able to go to books, books, books on our webpage right. and order directly right from there. It'll take you a direct link to order the book. Yeah. And, um, and then um, we also today at various points talked about Redeemer, which is, as I said, an incredible biography of uh, Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, Thy Kingdom Come, incredible book, Evangelicalism in America, which is what, 2016 or something like that. I think you did that one, um, maybe a little 214. Um, but these are great books and there's a ton more. But I, I got to tell you, I picked them up. I started reading them. We, we, um, I didn't realize that I actually had the Jimmy Carter book uh and and it was you and it was you that had written it as i came because i came up on you through uh, our friend john collins um, Oh sure yeah, yeah sure. john collins said uh you should talk to to, to randall balmer he says he's and so uh, i went and looked you up and said yeah and then when i went to order the book i had the book on my kindle and i said oh i already have this book so then i got a bunch <laughs> more and read a bunch more and uh you're an incredible writer uh, it's in, it's incredible information. It's important information. It's a whole field of study that we didn't necessarily believe we'd ever need oh, to yeah. explain why we've lost our way as a as an evangelical group of people. We're all evangelists. We've been told that in scripture. And so the work the work that you're doing is critical important critically important. The sort of stuff that would make your dad very proud, I'm sure. So thank you for what you're doing. You make me <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. And there he goes, Dr. Randall Balmer, our guest today on the Vickers Crossing. So thanks so much, uh, Randall, for for taking the time. Hey, uh, we've got uh, another episode coming up here in just uh, a few days as well. And Kevin and I, uh, I don't know if Ian's got it. Kevin and I have it. I don't think Ian's got it. Um, Kate Bowler is going to be joining us. No Cure for Being Human is the latest book. You might have seen Kate on, she did a TED Talk that was well, bring your Kleenex, folks. That's yeah, all I got to say. Amazing um, stuff. Yeah. And uh, author of uh, a very uh, popular New York Times bestseller, which was called Everything Happens for a Reason and yeah. Other Lies I've Loved. So Kate's yeah, going to be on the podcast. Book. I love that book. Buddy. Coming up as well. Yeah, yeah. So here's the new one. That's the oh. new one. No so we'll cure for being Kate. human. Yep. Looking forward to that. Hey, guys, thanks very much. And thanks to our sponsors today on the Vickers Crossing, to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family owned and operated, to Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, locally loved, and to Molly Made, make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Made London today. That puts a wrap on the Vickers Crossing. Go Tigers! Eat I'm Rob up. Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's in London. And I'm Kevin George. I'm at St. Aidan's Church in London.
And my name is Ian. Thank you for listening. And remember, Kevin, to always look both ways before you cross the street. (laughs) That was a tiger. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks!